Welcome to another life-changing edition of New Beginnings. This is your host, Furley Almonte. There are three major cancers that actually plague the nation. Breast cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer. Today, we're going to talk about the plumbing of the body. And we're going to learn about what our gut and our butt are telling us. You know, it's a very awkward situation. People do not talk about it because of where it is. But now, we have brought to you two different experts. There are specialists, they're colorectal surgeons who come all the way from Hackensack Meridian Southern Ocean Medical Center. I had to make sure that I say that correctly. And uh, with us today is Dr. Michael Del Rosario and Dr. Michael Caparelli. So they are both colorectal surgeons and I would love for them to share with us the different information that could change our lives forever. Well, let's start with you, Dr. Del Rosario. What exactly is colorectal surgery? Yeah, that's a very great basic question. Colorectal cancer is its a cancer of the colon. Uh, the colon is the large, also known as the large intestine, which is part of your gastrointestinal tract. That starts at your mouth and it goes all the way down to the stomach, to the small intestine, to the large intestine. And you can develop cancers in the large intestine. Uh, the cancer is where some of the cells have started to grow uh, unregulated and they start as a benign polyp from the size of a grain of sand becomes the size of a grain of pea uh, to a marble and eventually it, it becomes unregulated and turns into a cancer. Hmm. Now, Dr. Caparelli, like, is colon cancer more common in men or women? Um, it actually affects men and women very similarly. Men have a sli slightly higher rate of colorectal cancer in the United States. Um, there's about 153,000 case cases per year diagnosed in the U.S. Um, about 47% are in women, 53% are in men. And this also affects you know, the older population. About 58% are in patients that are older than 65, but it can affect people that are under 65 um, between their 40s and 50s as well. Now, why does it affect the older population more? Um, that goes back to basic uh, genetics. Um, there's a lot of environmental factors, dietary factors, and genetic factors. The older you get, um, it's kind of like a car. You know, the, the tires wear down, you know, the transmission starts to go and you get a little bit older, and it's the same way with our body. We have DNA, um, which is our genetic coding, and there's repair mechanisms that fix mistakes. And as you get older, those start to weaken, um, there's less repairs, and then those kind of grow out of control into, they can grow out of control into cancer if unchecked. Dr. Del Rosario, what exactly causes colon cancer? Would you say most common? What are we doing wrong? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we really don't know what causes colon cancer. We do know that it is something in the environment that we're exposed to, uh, but it's nothing we do. It's not necessarily something we eat or, or drink or smoke or lack of exercise, but it's it's something that happens in men and women, and it's it's a big reason why we should get screened. Hmm. You know, I have just seen actually on TV very, very recently that colon cancer is now affecting a lot of the younger population. What's going on? Well, for many years, the recommended uh, starting age for screening, meaning your first colonoscopy or checking for colon cancer, was 50 years old. Uh, they've recently, or actually not so recently anymore, uh, lowered that age to 45 years old because we are seeing colon cancer in, in younger people. Mm. Uh, the, the reason is, is not known at the moment, but it's, it's an alarming uh, event we're seeing and it, it you know, uh, made the insurance companies and the medical doctors suggest that you get your screening colonoscopy at a younger age because we're seeing it at, at, in younger generations. Dr. Caparelli, okay, would you say, what, uh, what do you call that test where you send your poop away? Oh, that one is a, uh, it's a DNA or a FIT test. Um, a popular name for it is, or the brand name is Cologuard. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it do and how reliable is a Cologuard? 
I like Cologuard tests. It's, I think it's useful in, in certain situations. Um, it detects the DNA and or blood that the cancer cells shed from the colon. It's great at detecting cancers when you have a cancer. It's about 92% uh, rate of detection. Once you get down to large polyps, it starts to fade, about 42% uh, detection rate. And then once you get down to smaller polyps, it drops down to about 8 to 10%. So I like it if you have a cancer already, but you know, as a colorectal surgeon, we do colonoscopies, and colonoscopy is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. We can go in and catch uh, polyps as they're, as they're developing and take them out right away instead of waiting for it to develop into a cancer. How long does it take for a polyps or anything that grows in our colon to develop before they become detectable? Uh, in general, colon cancers are slowly growing problems. It starts as a polyp. Uh, as I said, it may be the size of a grain of sand. And over years, that may grow to the size of a pea or a marble, eventually a golf ball. Oh, um, wow. But that's <laughs> that re- sounds very painful. Yeah, it's a yeah. slow growing process. But really, the old adage that the ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of cure is true here. If you do your colonoscopy, which is a screening test, and you catch that polyp at the the smallest stage you can remove it in effect you know uh, making a cure and preventing colon cancer okay this is a question probably a lot of people feel very weird to talk about let's talk about poop right because it does tell a lot right okay what type of signs are we going to be looking for when we go to the bathroom that will really trigger us to say hmm it's time for me to see a doctor so another good question, um, and, and it's great that you're raising awareness to talk about a sensitive subject. If you remember, breast cancer at one time it was very taboo to talk about breast cancer at the dinner table, uh, but then the numbers came out, women were dying of breast cancer. Now, it's very commonplace to talk about breast cancer. It's the same thing with colon cancer. You need to talk about it as uncomfortable as it may seem, but you know, when you ask about your poop, uh, yes, there are certain changes in the quality of the color, the size, the shape of your poop that may say that. That something's going on is going wrong but really most people who are diagnosed with colon cancer have no symptoms whatsoever actually let's stay on poop because you yeah. know like say when you said about character color consistency you know um, what what should you be looking for what's a normal poop supposed to look like well, it should be formed, it should be solid, uh, it should be uh, not, na- the, the abnormal poops really are easier to describe, uh, uh, narrow stools, uh, blood in your poop, uh, any sort of change that, that has uh, happened that uh, aside from your regular poops, it's any change in your, in your quality of stool. Okay, Dr. Caparelli, in the rectum, right? Like, um, how do you know if it's, say, for example, a regular hemorrhoid as opposed to something that would be a lot more alarming? Um, that you can only tell really with direct visualization, um, and we do that by using a little scope. It's called an anoscope. Um, you can also see in a colonoscopy, we'll use a colonoscope. Um, but you really need to look at it visually, and you need an expert that knows what he's looking at, because there's many times where a patient is told, oh, you have some bleeding, it's probably hemorrhoids, or someone without the experience may look at it and say it's a hemorrhoid, and then they show up in our office office and we take a look at it and it's something more sinister looking like a cancer. Mm. Uh, I've seen that many times. Um, Cancers you know, their hemorrhoids are more soft. Uh, they could fill up, swell, get ballooned, bleed a little bit. Cancers tend to be a little bit more stiff, a little bit more fixed, nodular, uh, asymmetrical. Um, and then really, you know, it's just kind of the eye test. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you really, if, you, if there's something suspicious, it should be biopsied, and that's how you'll know for sure. When a patient gets told you have colon cancer, Of course, it is very heartbreaking and very alarming. How do you stage colon cancer? Uh, The staging is an extremely important part of colon or colorectal cancer. Um, Anybody who is first diagnosed needs a full colonoscopy to make sure that there's not synchronous cancers or other cancers within different parts of the colon. Um, Then people will go for imaging tests. 
And whether it's colon cancer versus rectal cancer, um, it'll change which imaging you do. Uh, for colon cancer, you'll do a, a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. You're looking for distant spread. For rectal cancer, in addition to that, you're going to be doing an MRI of the pelvis. And that will really guide the next treatment, because the MRI will give you the depth of the tumor. And that's a huge deal uh, with regard to rectal cancers. Is it curable? Absolutely. It's absolutely curable. Oh, okay. That's nice and promising. It also depends on when you come in <laughs> and when we catch it. That's why the screening is so important. Um, if, if it's caught early or even middle stage, uh, even some late stage ones, um, it's curable and that's done usually with surgery. Um, some patients will get chemotherapy and radiation depending on if it's colon or rectal cancer, um, but it can be cured. And even patients come in and have spread to organs such as their liver or lung, if it's not too much of a burden to disease, you can remove that too and cure people. Wow. Actually, that's a, a lot of relief for people who are watching right now who may be very, very concerned that, oh my gosh, it is a death sentence. Here's something else that's awkward. Colostomy bag. Do all patients who are going through um, colon cancer treatments have to wear colostomy bags? Not, not at all. Actually, the majority of patients who have or are diagnosed with colon cancer and require treatment do not end up with a colostomy. Uh, it's something, it's one of the most common questions I get. Do I need a colostomy bag? Most cases of colon or rectal cancer can be managed without a colostomy bag. Oh, that's a relief because, but how, who are the people that may need that? Well, there are certain situations where if the colon cancer is obstructing you or causing a blockage, you may need a colostomy. If the colon or rectal cancer is very low down by the sphincter muscles where in order to cure you or try and cure you, we need to remove everything, you may end up with a colostomy. Um, but by and large, most patients who have colon and rectal cancer do not need a colostomy bag. Is it true that it can be reversed? Like once you have a colostomy bag that you don't have to wear it all the time forever? Some colostomy bags or ileostomy bags are temporary, some are permanent. Okay. Um, does it smell when you wear that? Like, you know, because people feel funny like that they have to wear that, that first of all, is it noticeable if uh, and even underneath clothing or do you have to wear loose clothes would you smell well that that is the, the most common uh, question I get with patients who are gonna need a colostomy is is this social appearance they're, mm. they're gonna they're, they they don't want to be seen in public a colostomy bag is not a sign you wear over your head that says I have a colostomy <laughs> bag it's underneath your clothing you, you can't tell that a per people amongst us are, are walking with colostomy bags. You probably can't even tell. Um, it does take some adjustment. It is a life-altering change, but you do get uh, used to it. Uh, when given a choice, the literature shows that if you, you know, given a choice of a colostomy versus surviving, most people will choose surviving uh, over over not having a colostomy when they need one. Dr. Caparelli, like um, when they go through treatment, you, you had mentioned chemo earlier, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Typically, how how many cycles of chemo do they go through? Do they also go through radiation? You know, things like that. What, what other treatments do you give? Mm -hmm. So you can split it into colon, colon cancer versus rectal cancer. For colon cancers, you do surgery first in most patients, unless there's distant mm -hmm. spread to the liver. Um, and then after the surgery, if you find that there's positive lymph nodes, their staging goes up, and they'll get uh, chemotherapy only. And usually about six cycles um, takes, can take up to about 12 weeks mm -hmm. um, or a little longer. If it's rectal cancer, it depends. A lot of patients will get staged, or you do your staging early on, and a lot of those patients will get uh, chemotherapy and radiation before they get surgery. And that's because the studies have shown if you do that before surgery, there's less chance of local recurrence of the cancer, and uh, those patients do better. Whereas if you want to give them radiation after you do the surgery, a lot of them have problems with that. Mm. Um, it's it's not easy. To, it's not easy to tolerate. Uh, it can irritate the rectum. Um, people will get diarrhea. Uh, people can have some bleeding, and a lot of times they don't finish their full course. 
So doing things up front beforehand for rectal cancer patients especially mm -hmm. um, has been shown to be better and it's now, uh, now the mainstay really. People don't want, you know, to have to go through that, right? Like, yeah. is there anything that we can do in our lifestyle to prevent us from getting colon cancer, doctor? To prevent it, no. Uh, you, you could be an Olympic athlete, a vegetarian, a non-smoker, never mm. have an alcoholic drink in your life. You would still be at average risk for developing colon cancer just by virtue of age, either turning 45 or 50. Um, but if you ask if there are certain uh, lifestyle alterations we can do, yeah, you can you can eat more fiber, less meat. Uh, you can exercise. You can uh, minimize the drinking, and you can minimize smoking. These are all relative risk factors that do increase your risk for developing colorectal cancer. But even if you did, you know, none of those vices, uh, just by virtue of, of age, aging, oh. you are developing a risk for developing colon cancer. The plumbing, the plumbing of our bodies just also age, right? Yes. Uh, and so it needs maintenance. You know, like, is there anything that we can do proactively? You know, like I know that there's the screening. Besides that, what other um, what other preventive measures can we take to be able to um, to keep gut healthy? Well, I think there's several things you can do and that you're in control of. Uh, one, weight loss, eating healthy, uh, getting more fiber in your diet, um, quitting smoking if you're smoking, drinking less alcohol. All these things, there's, there's nothing that's really been shown to be proven, but um, you know, in the epidemiological studies, those patients that do that or people that do that um, may have a better chance. Uh, you may have also heard in the news uh, about the gut microbiome this is a big topic oh, that's yeah. coming yeah. out. Yeah, I see a lot of those on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that, that's something we're really just scratching the surface on. Uh, we know that there's bacteria that line our gut and I, I, don't, I don't like to use the term good or bad bacteria but that's kind of what it is um, and it's been shown that if you're taking more fiber such as soluble fiber um, if you have more of that in your diet it, it, it aids it feeds the the good bacteria in your gut and then the good bacteria in your gut break that down and make fuel for your colon So you're cells. saying the, the ads that we see on social media like mm -hmm. we should go buy them and and for the ones that actually promote gut health uh, it's difficult to say there's nothing proven yet we don't know enough about it but there's a trend towards you know getting more fiber is better for the gut oh, okay mm -hmm. now you had mentioned, Dr. Caparelli, that your fam, somebody in your family had been affected by colon cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And so give us a little bit of a background of what was the most challenging experience that you had having to go through a loved one going through uh, colon cancer treatments? There was it, so it was my grandfather, and I was about 17 years old, and he was a you know, great patriarch of the family, World War II vet, um, and you know he very stubborn, you know, old school guy. Didn't want to get a ever get a colonoscopy, and then you know it just happened one day where he became obstructed, and he needed emergency surgery. Ended up getting uh, a surgery that they put him back together. It fell apart, and they he needed a colostomy. And um, you know that was a, a difficult to see him go through that and chemotherapy and get very weakened by that. Uh, you know this big statured guy losing a ton of weight, and um, you know just taking care of his ostomy and and just seeing the whole decline was you know devastating. So that was something that inspired me. You know I wanted to go into medicine. I already knew that, but you know I was thinking either research or. You know, when I saw that, I was, you know, with colorectal surgery, you can follow patients through their entire course. You know, the diagnosis, the treatment, and the follow-up. You know, you develop a relationship with people, and I wanted to, you know, see things through for, you know, patients. It's wonderful when you actually have a personal experience well, what, with whatever cancer, because it makes you a lot more compassionate about how it affects you as a patient and also the loved ones. Well, Dr. Del Rosario, when somebody needs to begin to see um, a, 
who do they see first? Like, uh, what, what's the first line of doctor they see? Be because you're surgeons. Um, who, sees, who sees them first before they get to you? Yeah, I mean, in, in truth, I'm, I'm, we are the last people you want to see, and I hope you never need us, but if you do, we'd be happy to take care of you. You should always reach out to your primary care physician first and ask them, you know, what, 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 what do you think about colon rectal cancer screening in me as a patient? Should I be screened? What are my risks? Um, and, but, you know, to be honest, a lot of times even doctors don't know enough, and which is a great reason for this show, is to educate the community and the patients to take it upon themselves to ask ask themselves, what should I do to in ensure my longevity or my life and my livelihood? Uh, you know, a lot of people are retiring, they're living longer, they want to enjoy life. You don't want to find out after retiring that you have a cancer uh, because it's just going to be a real downer. So, you know, the patients themselves should should educate themselves. And if there's anything you can take away from this show, they, they should, you know, talk about it at the dinner table, as we talked about. <laughs> but, you know, they it's, it's so funny because yeah. I'm Filipino, we, I don't know, yeah, yeah, I'm sure in other cultures, you don't want to talk about something so awkward right. on the dinner table, right. you know, especially, you know, uh, in um, how the elimination, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> right. you know, things about elimination. Right. But when somebody is ready to see somebody like you guys, what questions should they be asking? What qualities should they be looking at? Questions they should be asking and maybe what qualities they should be looking at in a colorectal surgeon? Well, they should ask us uh, how we do the surgery. A big uh, a part of uh, our treatment nowadays is robotic surgery. We use the Da Vinci system. We have this at the Hackensack Medical Center and Southern Ocean Medical Center. It is a finer surgery. It's a less invasive, minimally invasive surgery where you have smaller incisions. It's less pain, less complications, and a quicker return to function. Whatever age you are, whether you be 40, 45, retired at 60, 65, you want to get back to life, you want to get rid of the cancer, and get back to life quickly, uh, you should ask your surgeon if they do robotic surgery. Um, mm. And that's that's one of the common so questions. So that means you could be in the Bahamas doing the, the surgery? Is that what it is? Well, that's on TV, but we're, we're off in the corner of the room. We're in the room. We control the robot that does the surgery. Okay. And what qualities in a colorectal surgeon should they be looking at to be in partnership with? Yeah, I think you get a feel for the surgeon or a doctor that you go in and visit with and see what their bedside manner is like. Um, you have to, colorectal surgery is interesting because it's a very sensitive area for most people. And you know, you want to really have a good relationship and partner with them, make sure that, you know, you can feel that they're being compassionate towards you. They're sitting there asking you questions, getting to know you, and not rushing you out of the office. Um, I mean, everybody can be pressed for time, but I think when it comes to, especially the, the cancer uh, patients, um, you got to spend some extra time and really develop a plan with them and take them step by step and let them know that now they're part of the team. Um, it's not just us, it's, it's us, it's the oncologist, you know, it's the gastroenterologist, it's the primary care doctor, and, and probably most importantly, it's their family support network that really helps them through. So. Well, in Hacksack Meridian Southern Ocean Medical Center, what special treatments or options do you have available for patients that may be needing your surgery? Um, they, everything goes from, you know, they, we have onco uh, medical oncologists that do chemotherapy up to, uh, up to date, and uh, we have radiation oncologists if you need radiation. We've got gastroenterologists, and Dr. Darrow Zari and I, if you need a colonoscopy. Um, and then we do, we do the surgeries as well, and we follow you after the surgeries. And we both do minimally invasive surgery. Dr. Darrow Zari was talking about robotics. We both do robotic surgery. Uh, which is on the, the cutting edge and I think is going to be the future of most surgeries. Oh, that's wonderful. Less invasive is better, quicker recovery and all mm -hmm. that. Um, we're about wrapping up. And so if you have, you know, like, I would love to give you both the opportunity to share your personal thoughts, personal tips on how we can have our gut and butt healthy. And, um, you know, j give us your personal thoughts from all of your experiences that you have found success in treating patients with. 
Well, it, you know, it goes back to try to make yourself a little better by exercising more, eating better, uh, and also being educated. Uh, recognize when to get screened, uh, and again, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. But you know, recognize what the risk factors are for colon cancer and at what age you should be screened. What age is this, the recommended screening time right now? 45 years old in average risk individuals currently, uh, but if you have a family history, for example, a parent or a sibling who's had polyps or colon cancers, you may need to have your colonoscopy or your screening earlier. And uh, how often? It's, it depends. If It's not something you need to do every year. If you're clean and have no polyps and your average risk, you may be good for five to seven years. If you have polyps, depending on the size, it may be a year or two after that. How about you? Oh, well, I, Dr. Del Rosario nailed it, um, but I would just say just you know, quickly a few simple things. Exercise, increase your fiber intake, make sure you get screened on time, and then look out for warning signs. Any blood in the stool, don't just blame it on hemorrhoids. Mm -hmm. You've got to get that checked out by an expert. Um, those are the main things I would when say. When you say high fiber, like people are a little confused. Like, do you just get it from oatmeal or do you have to buy a special fiber diet or supplement to be able to um, basically have high fiber? Well, we, the uh, American College of Surgeons and the Colorectal Society recommend 25 to 35 grams. And if you go look at a fiber chart, you can Google it. Nobody's getting that in their diet. It's very rare. So I, I'm a big fan of, you know, taking uh, soluble fiber supplements, um, psyllium husk, some brand names, Metamucil, Citrusel, uh, Benefiber, um, and those, you know, are shown to actually be prebiotics. And you heard prebiotics, probiotics, all What's part the of the difference? Prebiotics is a fuel for the, norm, the natural bacteria in your gut. Probiotics are things, or bacterial cultures that are in yogurts or pills. Now, what's that like? Do you just put a scoop on on, yes. on any food, or like, does does it have to be an oatmeal, or you can add fiber to anything that you, or do you just put it on water? What's the best? The, the best is to one tablespoon psyllium husk fiber. Put that in eight to twelve ounces of water. Mix it. Drink it really fast, and you're done for the day. Done for the day. You know, like a, so I, I guess everybody out there is going to start buying, <laughs> you know, things because I'm just saying like. They're just saying that the, uh, a lot of our diseases also start with the gut. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, I mean, uh, it just gut health, it, it, the toxins we take in through food and, and, and the environment, it's, you know, as I said, there, there's no known cause, there's not one single thing that causes colon cancer, but uh, there, there are studies on people who migrate from uh, Europe or Asia to, to the Western United States and they assume a westernized diet, their colon cancer incidence goes up. It's something in the diet, so or, or the exposure to toxins or what, you know preservatives. So if your gut's healthy, that should translate into you being healthy. Yeah. Do you have a phone number where they could reach you both um, in case they it's time? I know that they would not want to see you, but when it's time, do you have a phone number that you want to share with us? Or just call, uh, I, I would, uh, just call uh, the hospital and ask to um, for your departments. That yeah, we're we're uh, at Southern Ocean Medical Center. We're on Nautilus Drive. That's where our office is. I don't have the. I'm sorry, I don't have the office know, number I, I, off the top that, of my head. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But of course, just hang, call um, Hackensack Meridian Southern Ocean Medical Center, um, and then of course you will be directed to the. What's the your department called? Department of Colon and Rectal Surgery. Colon and rectal surgery. Well, you certainly open our eyes to a lot of things. I, I love the fact that it is curable. I love the fact that you can actually do minimal invasive surgery and that it's, you know, a lot of things that we can all do to prevent. And so it's not, stop, guys, stop blaming yourselves, okay? You know, as you can very well see, our pipes are getting a little older. And so when with age come also maintenance required. And so, but there's hope and there are treatments available. There are really state of the art facilities available. One of them in, H in Hackensack Meridian facilities. So anyways, so now listen to what your gut and butt are telling you. Look at your poop, all right? And so don't dismiss any symptoms at all. And so hopefully this opened up a lot of um, you know, insights when it comes to our gut. So 
I hope that you are going to always continue to restore your body to normal health and also to continue to live lifestyle changes that will help us live long, vibrant, happy lives. All right. Until next time, this is your host, Furley Almonte. Have a fabulous day.